This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Thank you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're privileged to be joined by a familiar face uh, in Carbondale, um, Ambassador Donald McHenry. Ambassador McHenry is, is a native of East St. Louis, studied at ISU and SIU, moved to DC where he had an amazing career in business, politics, government, academia. Um, he has been one of the more distinguished uh, diplomats of our generation, well known here. He was recently uh, named a Lincoln Laureate for 2020, which is one of the most prestigious awards that an Illinoisan can win. So Ambassador McHenry, it's great to have you with us today. Good to be with you. Great. Well, we, we, we want to talk a lot about current events and foreign policy, but I think it might be helpful to ground our discussion and just in your background, because you've had a, a remarkable career in diplomacy and and politics and government. And I wanted to maybe begin by where you began at East St. Louis. And I saw an interview that you did some years ago in which you described growing up in East St. Louis and you said, it was not an easy situation, but if you worked at it, you could succeed. And then you gave a lot of plaudits to your mother in particular who worked several jobs and was just a real driving force in your family. So tell us a little bit about your, your East St. Louis years. Well, I was in East St. Louis in a better time than it, there is today. Uh, I guess it, I wouldn't have guessed at the time that I was growing up there that things would get, <laughs> would get worse and not better. Uh, but it was, a, as you know, it had been a, an industrial town with uh, very large uh, factories and, and production with, unfortunately, mostly unskilled labor. Uh, at the end of the war, all of that closed down as the companies moved to different areas where they could build new factories, get rid of labor unions, um, and in a sense be closer to some aspects of their production. This was particularly true uh, in the meatpacking uh, industry. So the, the town went, uh, I would say, down. It was, uh, and it left a lot of, of unskilled uh, labor there. And of course, it also, for historical reasons, had very little of a tax base. And when the uh, companies left, uh, the tax base uh, went with it because there went the jobs. But it was a, it was a bearable, thing. The schools were better then than they are now. Uh, we lived on, I used to say jokingly, but truthfully, we lived on the other side of three sets of tracks. And uh, uh, it was all walking from wherever you were. Um, it was a segregated city, not legally, but uh, practically it was, and that applied to uh, particularly to schools. Um, schools were fully practically de facto integrated uh, just as I was in high school. So, uh, but as I say, I think the, uh, the education was pretty good um, and much better than it is now. And I, I gather that your mother was, a, a, you know, a driving force of the family. I, you mentioned you had books and you would go to museums in St. Louis and you'd take the occasional trip to Chicago on the train. So tell me a little bit about just how she kind of instilled in you the, the love of learning and education. Well, they, uh, the family, my sister and my brother, um, were always sort of looked upon as different from the rest of the community. Though my brother was the constant person who broke out of the cocoon that my mother uh, created. Um, he could always be found long distance from home just before she was arriving home from work. And he, I think he had a sort of uh, of a communication system with uh, drums or something because he got the word that she was on his way, on her way home, and he would make it there just before. But 
she tried to uh, ensure that uh, we had, uh, we took advantage of the cultural uh, setting which we were in. St. Louis was across the river. Uh, we went to concerts and museums and, and uh, it was a very, and, and the library of course, and it was a setting in which I think enlarged our, our education um, much beyond the very small uh, sort of backward area where I grew up. And tell us how you then made the, the, the kind of the journey to ISU where you went as an undergrad and then from there to SIU. How, how did that unfold? Well, actually, it was the other way around. I actually went to SIU, um, not to enroll, but to, you know, as a high school senior, I went around looking at schools. Uh, my vision of schools was very narrow, not outside of St. Louis and Southern Illinois. Uh, but I went to uh, Carbondale uh, for something called Hospitality Weekend in which they invited students, I don't know whether they still have it, but they invited uh, high school seniors to come down and look at the school and spend the weekend there. And I went there uh, largely because my uncle had gone to school there and graduated. My mother had gone to school at uh, Southern Illinois, didn't graduate, she dropped out. Uh, so I went and spent a weekend there I was under the care of, of Dick Gregory, who was the person who was assigned, to whom I was assigned for the weekend, and he was to look after me. I saw Dick Gregory about uh, 30 minutes upon arrival, and 30 minutes before I departed, he was all over the place. But it was a good weekend, I looked at it. Uh, but I wasn't, uh, I think I was prejudiced. Um, I wanted to go someplace anyway, someplace else. So then you were at, at ISU for four years and studied um, international affairs, very active in debate, and then you went to SIU for graduate school for your And master. I went to graduate school uh, at uh, SIU. I followed my debate coach, actually. Um, my senior year, he left and went to, um, to uh, teach at, uh, at SIU, and uh, and I went there a year later. And then you also taught at SIU, is that correct? I taught and I coached debate. I was an assistant debate coach um, there. I had a peculiar uh, field of study, and that is I had a double major uh, as in graduate school. I studied uh, international affairs, and I also studied what was then called rhetoric and public address. Uh, and it worked out very well. I had uh, Frank Klingberg, who was a really outstanding gentleman and scholar as my advisor, and I had my old debate coach as uh, my advisor in the, on the other half of, uh, of my, uh, my studies. And, and so when you finished up at, um, at SIU, you moved to Washington and you, you studied at Georgetown, you taught at Howard, and then I guess it was in November of 1963, really the last month of the Kennedy administration, that you joined the State Department. That's, that's right. I, I was studying at Georgetown and, uh, by, uh, by night <laughs> and teaching at Howard by day. Uh, and waiting to get into the State Department. Uh, and I went, to, I guess I arrived only a couple of months before uh, the Kennedy assassination. Uh, it was sort of, well, it was bittersweet. And, and your initial focus at the State Department, as I understand it, one of them was on international organizations, which led to a real interest in UN issues. In fact, I think it's relatively early in your career, you came across, at least maybe from a distance, 
Adlai Stevenson, who had been one of your heroes from Illinois and was a kind of a global icon. Tell us about your, your, your in, initial interest in the UN. Well, actually, I went, uh, I was in the part of the department, which was called International Organization Affairs. And as you might guess, it had all kinds of layers of offices. And my little layer of office was called Dependent Area Affairs, uh, a fancy way of saying we dealt with those countries that were still colonies uh, and which, uh, uh, and it was, by the way, the same office in which uh, Ralph Bunch had worked when he was uh, in the State Department during the days of the uh, organization development of the UN. So I was in that office uh, and uh, handling all the trust territory, the Pacific Islands and, and Southwest Africa and Angola and Mozambique, all of those countries which had not yet gotten their independence. They, they weren't in that great bunch that became independent in 1960. Um, that office also surfaced uh, the U.S. mission to the U.N. And it was there uh, during that time that I had a chance to meet and work with uh, my boyhood hero, which, who was Adley Stevenson. Uh, Stevenson had been, as you know, um, in Washington many years earlier, had, uh, held high positions uh, there, had come back to Illinois and run for governor, um, and, uh, and from that position got the nomination for president twice. And I was an admirer of his, and uh, I got the chance to... Uh, work with him both in New York at the UN when I was assigned there on temporary duty uh, and at, uh, in Washington. As a matter of fact, his, his office was uh, two or three offices down from mine. One thing I was struck in, in an interview, you were talking about the US posture to the UN back then. And you said the U.S. was utterly determined to make it be successful. And in fact, you even told that tells the story that not only do we pay our bills on time, we paid it early to just to just really signal our support and our commitment. Tell us about that kind of early idealism, which really, I guess, lasted for maybe 25 years. And then we hit a hit a period maybe for the last 50 in which the, the country has looked at the U.N. with far more skepticism and even uh, criticism. Well, I think our, the, the UN has been unfortunate in that um, it was created to work in one way and the Cold War came along right at the beginning and made that difficult, not impossible, but very, very difficult. And for a long time, the, the, uh, the philosophy of the, of the United States was that we wanted that institution to succeed. Now there, we can argue that there was some hypocrisy in that. Uh, we were dominant in the UN. Uh, we could generally count in most of the UN institutions uh, that things would go the way we wanted them to go. And you can, uh, and we, we were determined uh, to make it succeed. Uh, we paid our bills not on time, but we paid our bills ahead of time. It was only in the Reagan administration that we started uh, as a result of some shenanigans with the uh, budget office, paying our bills uh, at the very end of the time that they were due. And it, eventually, you know what happens. We then didn't pay them uh, several times using one excuse or another, or we withheld funds. We ended up doing exactly the same thing that we had accused uh, the Soviet Union of doing in terms of paying our dues. But uh, I think we worked uh, pretty hard at it. Uh, 
and uh, were willing to experiment in terms of how you got got things done and worked with other uh, organizations, we were we exercised a leadership role. Uh, we've given up that role uh, slowly but surely over a period of time. Now there were always people who didn't like the UN to begin with for ideological reasons. I remember during my debate years as a student, as we drove from one university to another on weekends for debates, traveling in parts of Indiana in particular and seeing signs uh, get the United States out of the UN and the UN out of the United States. Um, and those were uh, not unusual signs. But I think we, we are in a, a different uh, era. We're going to have to, I think we've learned that we can't do without the UN. Uh, we're going to have to learn again uh, what it's like to be participants. And we're going to have to learn, uh, particularly after this current administration in the United States, we're going to have to learn how to lead without dominating, how to lead uh, in, in harmony and in uh, consultation with others uh, without assuming that everything is going to go our way. Well, I, I want to get to that in just a minute, but there's one other aspect. I mean, you're, you have such a rich and interesting career. We could spend all all hour, all day talking about it. But the one thing that struck me is after your, your initial State Department tenure, you spent some time in the think tank world and Brookings and the Council on Foreign Relations and Carnegie. And I was struck, as I was looking at your career, I was thinking of something George Schultz which once said, which was that one of the strengths of the American foreign policy system is the fluidity by which people move from government to think tanks, to universities, to businesses, to foundations and back. And this gives, American diplomacy and American diplomats a richness that is not really replicated by other parts of the in other parts of the world. I'm wondering in your own career, I mean, was this to some extent conscious or is it just, you know, opportunities arise? Were, were you aware that you are doing these things that were kind of enriching other experiences? Well, initially I wanted to go uh, to alternate between the State Department and, the, and academia. Uh, and what later occurred was an opportunity to go off to the think tanks as well. But in a sense, they are academia. Remember Brookings, the Brookings Institution once actually gave degrees um, in, its early, in its early days. So uh, this opportunity to go back and forth, I think is one of the strengths of American of foreign policy of American diplomacy. It went further than that. In the, there was a time when a president of the United States uh, thought nothing of going outside and bringing in a prominent Republican to take some kind of assignment. Uh, in my, one of my early experiences with uh, Bill Rogers, who later became Secretary of State, was when Lyndon Johnson asked Rogers, a, a Republican, former Attorney General under uh, Eisenhower, to come in and work on an assignment at the UN on Southwest Africa, which is exactly where I met Bill Rogers. Uh, that is very rare today. Uh, and yet, if you look back historically, it was not unusual in American history for that kind of thing to occur. I think other countries, uh, some of them look upon it as a strength. Uh, they're much more rigid in terms of their diplomatic service. You're in, you put on the uniform and you, and, uh, you take it off 30 years later or something. Uh, we have been able in the United States to go in and out, 
to be assigned, in fact, as a diplomatic in residence at a university while staying on as a, a member of the diplomatic corps. And even after I left the State Department and went to teach at Georgetown, uh, I was able to take on for two years uh, uh, as presidential envoy, special envoy on Nigeria. I was able to take on uh, an envoy position on Algeria. Uh, after the bombings in, uh, in East Africa, I was able to leave Georgetown and uh, review American embassies worldwide to see what we could do in terms of the security situation. Uh, so our system does offer this opportunity. Now, there's some dangers here. Uh, the danger is uh, that particularly given the role of money in our politics, uh, we will make diplomatic assignments and have the Foreign Service overly influenced by politics and money. And that, it seems to me, is, is a real danger. Ironically, you know, when you look at John J. McCloy and Avril Harriman and others from their earlier period of time, they're wealthy, they had money, but you don't think of them as in their diplomatic careers as wealthy and, and moneyed. Uh, that, but that's, is, that's not true today with, uh, with many others. Well, you know, you obviously had a critical role during the Carter years, and I want to touch on a couple of things just to talk about broader foreign policy issues. But I was struck by your story on on your uh, your interview with President Carter. Here's an interview with you um, for the UN job. You were invited to the White House. Uh, you had a good interview, and then pick up the story there because the fates interceded in kind of an un unexpected way that broke in your favor. Well. I I, I had an in interview uh, with the president. I'd been asked to come down and to make sure nobody knew I was coming down from New York. And uh, I went into the White House in a circuitous way um, and uh, had an interview with President Carter in the, uh, in the family quarters of the, of the White House. I had known Carter. Uh, in my earlier positions in the Carter administration. After all, I was uh, the US uh, uh, representative on the Security Council, and I had been doing negotiations on, on a number of things uh, at the time. But I sat down with, uh, with the president. We had a delightful conversation. He talked about <laughs> how the position became open and, and uh, and that I was one of those that he wanted to talk with and what kind of person he wanted to, uh, to have at the UN. And he was asking my advice on what kind of person. But in any event, conversation ended. He said he would get back to me and he had a number of people he wanted to talk with. And he walked out with me to the uh, to the circular driveway at the, at the White House. And I was waiting for the car to come, to come pick me up. He started into the White House and, and suddenly turned around and he came up to me and he says, no, I think I've decided. And that was it. <laughs> so um, that was the point. You were glad that your driver didn't arrive 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> Well, you know, they had the car, despite the fact that it was a State Department car, they didn't allow the drivers to, to stay on the grounds. They had to go outside and then come back in. So by the time he came through security and got back in, uh, Carter changed his head, <laughs> decided. Great. Well, when I, when I was reading about one episode in your career in which I think you were involved in a negotiation on Cyprus. 
And it was interesting because you're describing, you know, you're working with the Greeks and the Turks and the Cypriots, and it was back and forth, and there was a lot of recriminations. And at a certain point, you stepped forward and said, look, at, you know, we cannot change the past. That's done. We can't even really alter the present. What we can do is if we're good and productive and forward leaning is shape the future. And that struck me as kind of an interesting metaphor for just how diplomacy can and should work. Well, I think, uh, I think that's the philosophy one has to take to problem solving. Uh, the past informs you uh, so that you have a, an appreciation of how people got in the situation they're in. Uh, and you have to have a knowledge of current events. Who are the players? What are their current concerns? Both of those are necessary if you're going to shape the future. I had this problem, not just with the, with the Greeks, but with the Israeli and the Arabs. You'd sit down and talk with them, and each one wanted to give you 2,000 years of history. And you had to listen to 2,000 years of history. And by the way, the same thing was true with the South Africans. Uh, you had to listen to 2,000 years of history. And I, I tell you, it was tiring. And, and, uh, and in fact, in one instance, I, I learned a lesson uh, on the, as a result of this. Uh, Ron Fourie, who was the permanent secretary of foreign affairs at, in South Africa, was a person that I came to admire. Uh, I was sitting down with Brock one evening and he said to me that, he said, you really ought to listen to, to Pick Boda. You, you're impatient when he goes through his long rants and, and his uh, introductions. And he says, I know you've heard them before, but let him have his is say, listen to him. In fact, do anything you want to do. Um, he doesn't mind. He's, he just has to go through this process. And I then and there decided, well, even if I've heard these stories for over and over again, it's important to the individual to get it out. It's time consuming, but it's necessary. But again, you can't do anything about the past. Uh, you can't alter the present, but you can shape the future. Right. And I was also struck, I think this was in the context of some of your work in the Middle East, um, where you, you make the observation that the United States, just by dint of its strength, is a player. You know, that's a given. But you said that when it is strong and also when it's principled and also when it's perceived as being fair minded, those three elements in combination make it a remarkably productive and constructive power. And that sometimes we forget that all three of those elements need to be married together to be, you know, America at its best. Well, we've lost some of that. We've thought we, in fact, we've lost a lot of that. Um, we, um, in the first place, it's very important historically that we persuade others by example, by our example. Uh, if we don't live the kind of principle life that we want others to live, you have no chance of persuading them to do so. So uh, it is very important that we uh, that we act by by example, that we lead by example. I've always been uncomfortable when we call ourselves the exceptional nation. Exceptional nations don't have to go around talking about their being exceptional. Everybody sees it. And it is uh, very valuable, it's good 
position to be in, but you are exceptional in part by how you conduct and carry yourselves. Right, right. Um, let's talk, uh, one other kind of piece of, of the Carter years that, that struck me, and this was, I guess, near the end when the Soviets invaded um, Afghanistan, and there was this huge debate within the administration about what it meant and so forth. And you describe in an interview uh, that I think it was Dr. Brzezinski who uh, constructed this fairly elaborate theory, an arc of crisis, you know, and it was a very complex uh, kind of compelling theory. But you had a view that maybe that was overreading it, that there might have been a narrower set of decision makers in the Soviet Union responding to something much more immediate and, 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 and tangible. So talk a little bit about that, that sometimes maybe the United States has been very inclined to read very complex conspiracy theories or, or strategic plans when they maybe not are, are not really operative. Well, I think uh, there have been many times in American history when we've been captured by uh, the problem of the day and, or we have looked through the problem with the cloudy lens that was true with the um, Spanish-American War, it was true with Vietnam and with the Gulf of Tonkin. It was true in, um, in Africa and Angola where we looked upon the Angolan problem um, as a problem of, with the Soviets and the Cubans and overlooked the fact that the problem was among Angolans between factions in Angola. Uh, and I think, uh, I think I did then and I believe now that uh, our analysis of the situation in Afghanistan uh, was, uh, was faulty. I, I didn't, I did not see uh, this elaborate hunt for a southern port and uh, taking over the ports around the Indian Ocean and uh, the kind of elaborate things that were there. And of course, neither did the Soviets. Uh, if they did think in strategic terms, I mean, in elaborate st strategic terms, they sure got it wrong. They sent the wrong set of troops into Afghanistan in the first place. They ended up having to pull them back and send in a different kind of troop. Uh, they ended up uh, killing the guy who they thought was going to be their man uh, there in Afghanistan. Uh, I think the Soviets were just, uh, uh, had, had uh, what should I say, the Soviet bureaucracy was just old, um, set in its ways, little uh, in the way of, of vision, and uh, reacted in the same way that we have done in, let's say, in, uh, in our invasion of Iraq. Well, let's talk about the current moment. In, in an email exchange we had, you had mentioned that you know the U.S. has a, a really daunting challenge in front of it, uh, both to shore up institutions and policies that have been under threat for a period of time, and also to reassume global leadership. H how do we start getting back into the game in a, a positive and constructive way? That's very difficult because these things are interconnected. You can't sort of do one and then do the other. Uh, we have to get our house in order here in the, in the United States. That's true with our economy. That's true with the relations among various groups, uh, inequality which we have existing in the country. Uh, we have serious problems with health and they, and they uh, were present before this current uh, pandemic. We have infrastructure problems that have been neglected for a very long time. Uh, 
we uh, have not learned uh, or did not learn how to handle globalization in a in a way which did not come back and bite us in the rear. Uh, and now we have a situation where some of our institutions of governance are under severe stress. Congress is broken. The uh, difficulties with uh, things like the Electoral College and the uh, representativeness of our Senate, for example, are things that we're going to have to grapple with. Uh, not all at one time, but they're there. Uh, the tendency on the part of the country to uh, put power in the hands, more and more power in the hands of the president, and particularly to allow that president uh, the leeway to ex exercise discretion. Well, that's gotten us in a little trouble now. Uh, some of this you contribute to the, an individual, but some of it is that we are using institutions which were developed 200 years ago and need to be adapted to the current time. So we've got to get our, our act together with the states. Uh, at the same time, we can't afford uh, to believe that the rest of the world can go on its merry way while we work just on our uh, issues. Uh, in fact, some of the issues in the rest of the world are also tied up with our issues at home. The pandemic, for example. Uh, the whole question of uh, climate change. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the the idea of, of uh, migration among uh, among people, uh, globalization. They're all tied together, and so we can't. I think we can't expect that we're going to have the time to sit here and work uh, uh, very clearly and separately uh, and ignore those, those issues which are worldwide. So how do you do it? You've got to do them both at the same time. And that's going to require a good deal of skill. It's going to require uh, an education of our public, uh, to both be patient and to uh, greater, to understand uh, more clearly uh, our role in the world today. Do you think if a new administration came into power and, you know, in the first months said, we're going to return to the Paris Accords, we're going to try to rebuild the, uh, the Iranian uh, agreement, um, we're going to take an active role on climate change. Uh, we're going to take a global uh, lead in the pandemic response. I mean, some strong actions out of the box. Could that fundamentally shift the dynamic in ways that um, are, are needed? Well, it would be helpful, but I think uh, there's some damage out there that's not going to be done simply by a bunch of announcements. Uh, there are people in Europe who now are saying uh, even the United States sometimes can't be thought of as a reliable partner. Uh, there are people um, uh, in China, for example, who though they have their own problems and they contributed to the current ones, uh, have concluded that the United States uh, wants to keep them in a box or put them in a box uh, and that we are determined to do so no matter what. So there are some things that we can try and get back on the rails, but it's not going to be simply through a series of announcements. We can reverse some of this. Uh, one of the things we, we're going to have to keep in mind is that we, however much we might not like what went on in the last three or four years, it was the United States. And uh, that is going to be out there in the minds 
of our own people and in the minds of the world community. And that's not going to go away. We had a guest uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Bill Burns, who I'm sure you know, a uh, former diplomat and now at Carnegie. And we were talking about American diplomacy. And one of the things that he said that he's troubled about is that we've made only modest advances in terms of making the diplomatic corps look more like America, be more diverse, more inclusive. How, how do you read um, what has been accomplished since you uh, walked into Foggy Bottom in 1963? Well, you know, it's a mixed bag. We've made some progress, but we've uh, taken a number of steps backward. Uh, the State Department is a very difficult thing for anyone to move uh, up in. Uh, it's a long, takes a, it takes a long time to get a feeling that you are responsible for something. You, for the most part, uh, for 10 years, 15 years, you may have responsibility for just a tiny bit of a piece of foreign policy. Uh, and uh, so it's frustrating even under normal circumstances. It's even more frustrating uh, in, this, in the current situation where in many instances, uh, people are brought in from the outside to take positions that they really aren't qualified for. Uh, we've, we have made, we made a lot of progress during the uh, Carter and uh, Clinton years, and to some extent continued in the, in the uh, Obama years, in broadening uh, the composition, uh, group composition of the State Department. But it doesn't last. Uh, people get frustrated uh, that they don't move up and they want to go faster. Uh, and so we we find ourselves in many places, in many instances, of running in place. What ought to be progress and build it upon, uh, we haven't been able to do. And so there are lots of things going on right now, hearings on the Hill uh, about trying to reinvigorate uh, the effort to make the State Department um, more, look more like the United States. Right. Well, Ambassador, I'd like to turn to some questions. We've gotten a lot of questions have been sent in to us. And um, the first one I, comes from some old friends of yours, Bill and Molly Norwood, who are writing from Arizona. But they ask, how did the time and education you received in Carbondale assist you in your outstanding career? Well, I, think, uh, I think my time in, in Illinois, uh, both uh, at Illinois State and uh, uh, and at uh, Southern Illinois were uh, extraordinarily important in my education and in my career. I, I call myself a child of Illinois, and I, and I mean that. Um, and many times uh, as I've traveled around the world and talked with people, they say they came to the United States and they traveled around. I said, well, if you haven't gotten on a Greyhound bus, and uh, driven through the Midwest and Illinois and Indiana, you haven't seen the United States. And I think to this day that's true, though even the Greyhound bus, if it exists any longer, uh, goes on these expressways and so you don't see the small towns uh, that we uh, at once had to drive through. But uh, the uh, particularly the participation that I had uh, as a debater. Um, the uh, ability to work very, very closely with, uh, with professors and to get to know them uh, in small classes and, and, uh, and personally in, the, in, a, in a social setting. Uh, these were very important to me in terms of, of my own education. Right. Well, we have an, another question from a, of actually a former student of yours, uh, Ken, 
who apparently took an 8 a.m. class, and he's, uh, I guess he may have been late sometimes for your 8 a.m. class, but he, he asked, what is your projection for the timeline for the U.S. to return to uh, the world alliances, NATO, et cetera? You know, however, how will we regain our status again? I guess you suggested that earlier, that it's not going to be an easy, immediate uh, return. No, I th look, I'm, I'm uh, positive in terms of the long haul. But it's not going to be easy to get there. As I say, we've uh, made a lot of enemies, even Germany. I, I don't put them as an enemy, but, but even, even the Germans have had second thoughts about how dependable the United States is uh, in, in uh, current circumstances. So it's going to be very difficult for us to do. Um, yeah, to some extent, uh, it's going to be determined by how our next election comes about and what the results of it, uh, of it are. Uh, but I, I, I think we will recover these, this uh, unfortunate series of incidents that we've been in, in but with great difficulty. And I, I think it will take, for example, it's going to take us years to rebuild the State Department. Uh, we have lost uh, hundreds of years of experience uh, as a result of the resignation retirement of, uh, of uh, a number of first class people who are in the State Department. And I don't see that, I don't see recovering from that uh, to be a very quick process. Um, Bill from Chicago asks, what is the effect on our diplomats with a Mueller investigation casting a political shadow over high, highly seasoned diplomats and the attendant effect upon our allies around the world? Well, it hasn't been one of our, our better days. Um, there's just out of a new report from the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee today uh, on the run-up to the to the uh, 1916 uh, election, uh, it's one of those institutions, one of those series of institutions we're going to have to rebuild. Uh, our intelligence agencies are, in, are have suffered uh, to some extent now, as so has our military as a result of what happened in Lafayette Park. Uh, as a result of what has happened by the military's having had to shift money from its, from its uh, needs to building a fence along the wall. Um, institutions like that, and, and you can go further. Who believes now that the FDA is what it was? Uh, there's some skepticism as, that, as to whether the FDA is acting in a disinterested, objective, scientific way. Same is true with the CDC. So it's going to take some while to rebuild these, uh, to rebuild these institutions. Okay. Duncan from Mur Murfreesboro wonders about um, the UN Security Council and particularly the, the pernicious effect of uh, vetoes and wonders if it would be better to move to a system of weighted voting rather than the use of vetoes. And I know you have said that the US culture on the veto has shifted, that initially we were deeply reluctant to use it, even opposed to using it, but then it became kind of a permissible tool of negotiations. Well, I'm not sure it was a tool of negotiations. It was, uh, I think uh, our, attitude on the veto uh, was affected by two things. Uh, the first was that we increasingly became um, a minority voice, not just in the Security Council, but in the UN. So we couldn't count on things going our way as we had to take into account uh, the views of others with different perspectives. And secondly, um, the U.S. use of the veto has been very, very influenced by domestic politics. That is particularly true on the Middle East. Um, 
we started using the veto uh, and we did so in circumstances which which uh, were more uh, related to domestic political circumstances than they were to the issue at hand. So I, I would not, you know, in an ideal world, you don't want a veto, but a veto is a reflection of the fact uh, that uh, participants in the UN uh, have different degrees of, of power. Uh, different influences. Uh, I, and my own feeling is that with the exception of domestic political affairs, I wouldn't have very much difficulty making my way in the Security Council without a veto. Wouldn't, I, I don't think I would. I could be wrong. But look, on the uh, on well, the situation with regard to uh, to uh, the Iran hostages, we made that, we made it through that, forcing the uh, the Soviet Union to use its veto, and in some instances, forcing them to abstain. Uh, I remember it uh, on one resolution on on Iran. The, representative from Bangladesh came to me and he was very upset. Uh, there was this issue in the Security Council. His country was having all kinds of demonstrations over some kind of uh, religious issue. He felt very strongly that he had to abstain, but they were deeply in debt to the United States, dependent upon the United States for food. And I said to him, look, you vote the way you feel you have to vote. And we are not going to cut off your food on the basis of a vote. Now I could say that, A, I believe it. But secondly, I very comfortably had in my pocket a vote that people thought I didn't have uh, from Jamaica, for example. Uh, where it didn't matter if he didn't vote, the Afghan didn't vote for us. He didn't, but the Jamaicans did. Brian from um, Robbins, Iowa, asked a question. He said, what is, it, what, what is your reaction to President Trump being laughed at during the UN session? Well, it's an indication of, of uh, what the international community thinks of the president of the United States. Uh, it's something we've never, we had it laughed at in the UN and we had them, him laughed at in a meeting of the, uh, of the group of, of eight. Um, it's unfortunate. Mary from um, Iowa City asks, Tell me about your teaching career at Georgetown. What did you like? What did you love about teaching? Oh, I love teaching. Uh, I was spoiled. I taught uh, a seminar with uh, graduate students and sort of uh, uh, honors seniors. And the seminar was always very small, never more than 15 students. Uh, and uh, it was, ironically, the seminar always had the same name, Problems in Multilateral Diplomacy. And uh, you could use the same name and not have the same problem to explore because there were plenty of, of those around. But it was uh, a fun thing to do. Um, teaching was a fun thing to do. I, I believe very strongly that I think it was Kissinger who said that um, it was necessary for one to go back and forth because you were using intellectual capital while you were out as a diplomat and you had to sort of put more money in the bank by going back and studying or I guess recharge your batteries is another way of looking at it. And I found that the, the teaching was a perfect opportunity for me to uh, share my experiences 
uh, with students without sort of reminiscing. Um, and for me to uh, uh, have my own outlook, uh, my own experiences, my own thoughts questioned, sometimes rather pointedly by students. Tell me about, I know you were on, I think the board of Coca-Cola for 37 or 38 years, a really long time. Tell me how being on a board like that helps inform your worldview, how you can bring some of those insights back into the classroom. Uh, tell me about just working on a, a high level board and how that enhanced your professional development. Well, one of the things that it becomes clear very early uh, for those who believe that uh, uh, private capital is works perfectly and government is screwed up. I can tell you that both <laughs> both share <laughs> that uh, that tendency. They can be just as screwed up uh, and make uh, decisions which are unthinkable and influenced by things that you would think they would not be influenced by. So I think uh, one of the first lessons I had was that each institution had something to learn uh, from the other. Uh, but I, particularly with multinational corporations, uh, you find uh, that uh, you, you, you covered many of the same, same problems. In fact, I used to refer to Coca-Cola offices in various parts of the world as Coca-Cola embassies um, and, uh, and found that uh, we, we had the, the same thing. We dealt, for example, in the Middle East, we were boycotted by the, uh, by the uh, Arabs uh, because there was a bottling plant in, uh, in Israel. And uh, for a long time, we had to find ways of negotiation to get around that and persuade the Arabs uh, that uh, a bottling plant in, the, in Israel uh, should not stand in the way of, of our relations in terms of, of the Middle East as, as a Coca-Cola company. Uh, and you, you, as you, you went around, you found that that same kind of problem that you had to deal with. We, same thing was true in Southern Africa. One of the great problems of the, of the soft drink world, as you may remember, is the, the way in which PepsiCo got around uh, the uh, boycott of the United States in terms of the sale of Pepsi in the Soviet Union, and Coke didn't get around it. Uh, Pepsi entered into a barter arrangement. We will, uh, we will allow you to sell Pepsi uh, if you will allow us to sell uh, Stolichnea vodka in the, in the United States. And for a long time, that is the way that that carried on. Coke wasn't allowed to uh, sell Coca-Cola in the Soviet Union, though secretly Coke had a had two things going for it. It had uh, this uh, soft drink business called Fanta. And Fanta was a big seller in the Soviet Union, uh, sometimes sold better than Pepsi. And it sold better than Pepsi because the Soviets didn't have very good refrigeration and colas without refrigeration don't taste very well. But Fanta without refrigeration tastes pretty good. So, so that situation was there. And then, of course, at the end of the Cold War, sticking with, uh, with Coke for a moment, uh, when the Cold War ended and the territory of Eastern Europe opened up, Pepsi was stuck with arrangements with company, uh, government-owned companies uh, in Eastern Europe. Coke wasn't in those places, had no relationships with them. So Coke was able to come in in a very short time and build new plants, highly efficient plants, all over Eastern Europe. 
Pepsi was stuck with this old, worn out, inefficient plants. And so just suddenly you had a change uh, in, the, in the relationship. And that had as much to do uh, with, uh, with international politics as anything else. Wow, interesting. Well, Ambassador, for a final question, I, I wonder if you might have a, a reflection or two on Paul Simon. Your, uh, your paths must have crossed. I've seen some photographs of you two together. Uh, tell me about your, your reflections on Paul Simon. I knew Paul, uh, both from his time here in Washington uh, and when he went back to uh, SIU and started the, the Institute. Uh, he was uh, he was particularly uh, active in foreign affairs, very much interested, uh, for example, in the role of uh, of uh, foreign language in terms of of, uh, of education and, and international affairs. Um, he was a, a liberal, unabashed. Uh, liberal, uh, something of a scholar. At, at one point I was trying to catch up with him and I couldn't find him. Uh, and I left messages all over the place. And he finally called me back and he said uh, he was up in Lovejoy. He was working on some kind of um, book or an article about uh, Peter Altkill, uh in Lovejoy and was just sort of Hiding out there, so he was uh, he was a delightful person. Great, thank you. Well, Ambassador McHenry, thank you so much for your time. It's been delightful to to visit with you, and I we're hopeful that you'll be back in the state to claim your Lincoln Laureate. I, I know the, the the event was supposed to be earlier this year, but if it's next year, we would love to be able to divert you back to Carbondale and visit the institute. We have pictures of you on the walls here, and. Uh, you are a, a really integral part of SIU's uh, legacy. So thank you so much for your time and, and be well, and we hope to see you in Carbondale soon. Well, thank you, and, and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I've, you've had a number of uh, good friends of mine on, on your schedule so far, and, uh, and I'm very much interested in following uh, this particular program now. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate uh, it. And thanks to all of you for joining us for another edition of Understanding Our New World. We appreciate your joining us. We will have this interview with Ambassador McHenry on YouTube uh, tomorrow. And uh, thank you for following us on social media. And thank you for your support, which keeps the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. So thank you so much. <laughs>